I'm going to read Mitch's bio in a second, but before I do that, I just want to um, say congratulations, Mitch. I read your book cover to cover over the last couple of days and found it fascinating and very much a reflection of who you are as a designer and an educator and a human. Um, it has a very accessible um, kind of sensibility and approach, and, and I do hope that many of you will get a chance to read it as well. I don't and know why I'm standing off stage. No, no, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> Mitch Goldstein, Dan, glad to meet you. Yeah. And, and as one who's written a book before, it is a hard <laughs> book. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I, who's, yeah. who's coming with me? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. You, you'll need that. I, I can do this now. Right? That's, is that I thought about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, we'll get cozy here. Um, just a, just us and 40 or 50 friends. That's right. Okay. Um, life as a design student is filled with questions. Goldstein, associate professor at RIT School of Design and a furniture design MFA candidate, has many answer, uh, answers shared in clear, clever, and sage advice that is helpful for students at any level of their education, as well as anyone thinking about attending design school and wondering what it's really all about. Um, for design students and art professionals, Goldstein is a brilliant resource for real-world thoughts about design school and creative practice, drawing on years of teaching design and his popular, quote, Dear Design Student Twitter project, Goldstein explores aspects of how to get the most out of design school experience and beyond as a creative professional. From collaboration and critiques to practice and process, this is an inspiring roadmap for design students as well as a valuable guide for design professors to help them understand how to shape curriculum from a student's perspective and better the collaborative experience. Goldstein is a designer, artist, educator, and author based here in upstate New York. He's an associate professor at RIT where he teaches graphic design and pursues furniture design in the College of Art and Design. He's written about design education for years with published articles in Communication Arts, Adobe 99U, and AIGA. So, Mitch, I thought I would kick this off. After you, Josh. Um, with a couple of thoughts, and um, for the sake of the audience's uh, edification, um, again, this is an open forum, and we want to steer it towards your questions. Um, but I, I will start with a little bit of a, a, a provocation. Um, your, your book reads like a manifesto uh, for taking control of one's destiny, not just as a student or a teacher, but as a whole person operating in the world. Um, you embrace difference, uh, empathic behaviors, and you emphasize self-care. Um, in your book, learners must be active. Um, in fact, active learning is, is one of those phrases yeah. that comes up over and over and over again. I Absolutely. appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you embrace gray versus the black and white perspective on design education. Um, you argue for a less hierarchical version of design education than what has been taught historically, I would say. And you use possibly the best argument I've ever heard for why in art and design schools professors are most commonly known by their first names. And I won't spoil that. <laughs> you have to buy the book to find out the answer to that. Yeah. So, uh, my <coughs> intro provocation. Um, architect Bjark Engels, who you probably Big. know, yep. uh, pokes at the iconoclastic Mies van der Rohe statement, less is more, by arguing that yes is more, sorry, less is more than yes is more. Yep. Um, and I have a feeling this resonates with you. So I'm wondering if you could start by addressing that. Whew. That was a lot of question. Yeah, that was good. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, I, a lot of you in here have had me as a teacher, right? So I think that you all can know whether I'm full of it or not. But I, I really do think that it, it, this is about, um, it, it, as students, you all have to kind of pull from your teachers. But I think traditionally education is this idea of where the teachers sort of know the stuff and they like tell it to you and then you tell it back to us and you either get an A or an F depending on how well you do that. And that does not exist in this world, in my opinion. Um, I think it is very much about asking, pulling, saying yes, give me more, I'm curious, let me take 
Um, and so I think of it, it's almost like a maximalist education. Like, it's as much as possible, this is a wonderful place, RIT and higher ed in general, to try a whole bunch of stuff, some of which you're gonna hate, it's just the nature of being a creative practitioner, you're not gonna love all of it, but you can like come into this place with like just a big group hug, and you can take all of it in. And so like, I have no business whatsoever getting a master's in furniture design. Like, I can't believe Andy's letting me do that, like it makes no sense. But it's been incredible, and it's amazing. And I look at it like it's an opportunity. Like, I would feel almost like a jerk not doing that. Because I get this incredible opportunity to do that, and I think you are all in the same boat, right? That you have this chance to sort of, anything goes here. And, and it's an incredible place to be. It's just a wonderful place to be, and I think RIT especially is just so fluid and open, and like, like we want kind of all of it in a way that's really kind of wonderful. And it's kind of magical sometimes, you know? Really, sometimes stuff clicks together, and you're just like, wow. How did that happen? Well, you're, you know, part of the change, right? You're, you're I mean, responsible so. <laughs> for this, the, cultivating this environment. I mean, I didn't want to say it, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to that, to, to what you just said, um, you speak quite a lot in the book about um, historically toxic environments, um, not, not necessarily institutions, mm -hmm. but the culture of critique, uh, the culture of the all-nighter. Um, oh, yeah things which um, perhaps are, are outdated or were never really useful to begin with. Right. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your, your vision of that, you said warm yeah. and fuzzy. Um, yeah, there's like, um, I, I have this, somebody actually recently said, what's your next book? And I'm like, well, let's hold on a second. <laughs> I don't think we're there yet. Um, but I think my next book would be about like toxic mythology in art and design. And there's a lot of it, right? So this idea of um, hustle, 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 work till you're dead, you'll sleep over the summer, it's just, it's bullshit. It's not what this is about. This is not about killing yourselves to make a project, right? If you're up at 5 a.m. setting type, I don't think that's what you should be doing. I think you should be asleep at 5 a.m., right? I think that's a healthier thing for you to do. Um, my experience, and I think many of the teachers in the room would agree, that the stuff you do at 4 in the morning is not awesome. So it's kind of like you're not really getting anywhere. And so I think that, that as we come into you know, the, the, the 21st century, um, the sort of um, traditional education of high modernism and stuff like that, and, you know, obviously Massimo, an incredibly important person, right, and Layla, but that idea of um, you gotta do all-nighters, you gotta kill yourself for this, this is the only thing that matters, I think it's just insane. I, just, I think it's deranged. And, and so I find stuff like that very toxic, because what it is, is it's like a cancer. It, it sort of breeds badness in ways that are not really good. So, I don't want to speak for Josh, I'm pretty sure we both want you to work your butts off and like try hard and, and get a lot out of this, but I don't want you to be unhealthy. I don't want you to have like anxiety and panic attacks over your work. It's just not worth it. I'm not saying it's not important, but not having panic attacks about whether you pick the right font is not where you should be trying to accomplish here. So, uh, designers inherently, I think, are planners, or yes. we learn to be planners if we don't start out that mm -hmm. way. Um, I can speak from personal experience, some of my most organized students are athletes mm -hmm. who have incredibly rigorous schedules that they must attend to in order to get their other things done. And these generally are not students who are doing the all-nighters, they're figuring out ways to make time. In your book, you offer, I would say, kind of tips uh, and suggestions beyond, you know, you shouldn't be up all night. Right. I wonder, I, I don't want to, you know, yeah. give away too much We don't want to give it away, content, right? But yeah. Any, any Yeah, I think that the there's so many things, because you guys have to remember that I was in school not all that long ago, um, despite me being slightly older than, than, than you know, you may realize. Um, I, I only graduated with my BFA in 2006, so I'm not that far out from where all of you are. Um, and so I have found that really understanding how to like organize and just have everything kind of ready to go and dialed in and planned out, it just alleviates so much stress and so much anxiety. Something that I discovered recently, which sounds almost like, like a silly thing to say, is actually like printing out a list of stuff to do. Not on your phone, not on your tablet, an actual paper. And then you can use this thing, it's like it's got a, it's like got a lead in it and you can write with it, it's like a pencil. And then you can cross stuff off when you're done. It sounds really stupid, I swear to God it is like a game changer in terms of getting stuff done. I don't know what it is, if it's the tactileness, that there's just something about like literally going, did that, did that, that feels great. So I think that's really important. And I think that 
obviously you all are in a very intense environment. College is, in is supposed to be intense. But like, you should, you know, go to a movie and stuff and like get off campus once in a while and take a breather. Um, I, I talk in the book about how I, as a teacher, will not infrequently, students hand a project Thursday, they don't have anything until Tuesday. Because in professional practice, yeah, you might work a lot, but you get weekends off fairly often, maybe not every weekend, right? But in this place, that doesn't really happen. And that's not RIT, that's college, right? You all are going kind of like flat out for three months at a time, every day. And that is not really how commercial practice generally works. Yeah, you might have some jobs where you're pumping some overnighters and stuff, but generally speaking, this style works. And so I think that you all should plan to take breaks. You should plan to like, I'm not working today. Like, I'm just not doing anything today. I'm gonna go to, on a walk, I'm gonna go to a movie, whatever. And it sounds like it's laziness, but I actually disagree. I think it's, it's being self-aware of like who you are. And I think that stuff is super, super, super important. It's more, as I get older, it becomes more and more important. Mm -hmm. Just taking care of yourself as like a human being. Like, I think you have to be kind of a good human to be a good designer. You can't just be a good designer. You also need to be like a good human being. And part of that is taking care of yourself. Yeah. And so it sounds kind of silly to like, like I'm not like a medical per you know, I don't have any expertise in this. But I have learned that it really helps a lot. Just a little bit of exercise, eating, you don't have to eat help, but like just eat something decent once in a while. Just kind of like basic stuff. It, it's a game changer for me. It, re it really is. And I'm, I know it sounds like me being facetious, I'm not. It really did alter kind of how I made work and stuff. Well, you know, you are what you eat, I suppose. Yeah, right? I suppose. <laughs> um, it, you're, it really comes across yeah. in your book, your, your care or your thoughtfulness, your, your um, desire to see people try to understand that wisdom that you've acquired. I particularly loved the um, suggestion that you begin making lists as young people. That, that happened for yeah. me in college, and, and I still do it. I make a lot of analog lists, and I, I think because so many of us in visual programs are visual people mm -hmm. by nature, there's something about that tactile experience of, of planning things out, crossing them off, and, and having those reference points, which are analog, right. that you can, in human scale, in, in an architectural reality, see. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's different. Yeah, I think. and I'm not talking about making a list so you can post it on Instagram with like hashtag productive. Don't, don't do that. These it's not necessary. This is for you, yeah. not for us. It's not for the world to see how organized you are. It's really just about you managing all the stuff you do. When you all get out there and start working, you are generally not going to have three different bosses with three different projects all going on at the same time for three completely different people that are all due in like two weeks. That's just not how commercial practice generally works. Like It's such a weird environment here. It's amazing and it's interesting and it's kind of how it works, but like I... I mean, I'm aware of it, I obviously wrote a book about it, but like, I think we forget how intense your reality is in college. We think, oh, it's college, it's like keg parties and stuff. Yeah, and you're also like working 8,000 hours a week on top of that. And we just gotta kind of remember that, I think, as educators and really as students. Like, I think y'all really need to pay attention to that stuff. Really think about what's good for you as sort of a person first. Well, that's a perfect segue into something that I, I thought was really wonderful um, in your book. I mean, I. First of all, the graphics are great. You know, all of your <laughs> there are diagrams, yeah. Um, you know, kind of uh, chapter intros are yep. wonderful. Um, you characterize the design school experience in its ideal manifestation uh, as highly collaborative and immersive, um, and you you argue that the stage on a stage, not not that you're yeah, doing that. Not that that's what this is. Um, yeah. Ver is is antiquated, and that um, for you and you explain this wonderfully in, in your diagram yeah. um, uh, that that a, a partnership in learning model is is much more contemporary and and creates a kind of quality and a leveling effect that comports with the idea of designing education at its core. So again, without you know yeah. selling too much of your book, I'd love it if you could speak to that. I mean, I think it's who had me for two D? A few of you, right? What's the first thing I showed you? Little diagram, right? Where it's like, the, I'm the teacher, high school, you're the little 11th grade students, me tell, you listen, kind of bullshit thing, right? But college isn't like that, it's a circle. I'm in the circle with you all. And I'm literally, I'm not even metaphor, I'm like literally, I have like a thesis to accomplish right now. Like I'm literally in it with you. But even when I'm not pursuing another master's degree, I'm in it, right? 
And so I think that that idea that I am not, I, I the teacher, we're not inherently better or smarter than you all. We just know different stuff, and you know stuff I don't. I, I can't explain how important that is. It's so critical to what we're doing, because in my opinion, there are almost no facts in these disciplines that we're learning in CAD. Almost none. Maybe history is a fact, but it's basically opinion. Maybe it's best practices, maybe there's some proven stuff, but broadly speaking, it's a lot of opinion and sort of thought and interpretive gray area. And so, I am in it with you. I don't want you to just wait for me to tell you what to do. How many of you have had me say to you, you come up to me and you say, hey, how would I, is it okay if, and I go, I have no idea, and I walk away from you. You've had that happen. Look at the hands, right? I don't say that to be funny. It's, it's, for, it's for a reason. It's because it isn't about what I want. And I think that's like a really important thing to remember as educators, right? You, you think we're the, we're the experts, and we are in some ways, but it's kind of not about that in this context. I think it's much more about an exploration. It's about like a, um, an intense active curiosity. And at the end of the day, that's all it is, is about being curious in a way that is active and not passive. Not casually interested, but like, that's cool. I'm going to do something like that sparked an idea, and I'm going to blah, 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 blah. That's what it's all about. And I think as educators, and I, I don't want to speak for everybody here, but I think we are all in it with you. Um, I make it a point to say that, but we're all in it. We're, we're all constantly interested in this. We're not, we don't teach because it's like a cushy job. I don't know if you guys realize that. Um, we don't teach to get rich, I can promise you that. But we teach because it's like the most interesting thing in the world to do. It's like the world's greatest job. And I'm not saying that because Todd, the dean, is sitting in the audience. It is literally the world's greatest job. Because... I am paid to be interested in stuff. And I'm not paid to be interested in stuff and then dictate it to you. I'm paid to be interested in stuff with you. And I think that's an amazing, incredible thing to get to do. It's just an incredible thing to get to do with your life. So. Well, I mean, you speak to that in, in many ways in your book. Um, you talk about the use of uh, social media platforms as a way of creating transparency and kind of revealing um, the struggle that, that we continue to have right. as 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 people, as educators, as professionals, uh, and you and you argue that that continues to, to level the playing field in that way. And I think that's great. Um, I was thinking about that a bunch. What what um, given your um, attitude in the book about really trying to tear a new one for design education. Um, <laughs> You know, what, what models out there are doing better? You know, like, for example, I was yeah. at Cranbrook recently. Right. All the faculty have professional studios yeah. where they're producing work for clients, and their students are involved in that, mm -hmm. which is a, a, it's a, a head scratch right? if you think yeah. about how you achieve that, but they've been doing it, they're known for doing it. That's how like, it works. It, yeah. What else can we do? Um, I mean, I think that's it. I think eliminating the, the borders, the boundaries. It, it's, it's, I think there's this, like, remember when you guys were in high school and you maybe ran into your teacher at, like, Wegmans or something, and it was, like, the weirdest thing in the world? Like, we're just people trying to do stuff, and so I want to eliminate those borders. I, I like the stuff fuzzy. You know, I like when, when I, and again, many of you have sat, been in crits with me, like, I'm not the one doing most of the talking in a critique, because I'm not inherently the one that necessarily has the kind of best thing to say. And so I think that's like really important. So I think that idea of um, Cranbrook is such a unique, weird place in a wonderful way, where like I'm, I'm friendly with Elliot Earls who runs the 2D program, and he is getting critiqued by his students on his work as part of it, and that's like amazing. And that doesn't necessarily work in a college with you know 20,000 people, but at Cranbrook, which is a very small little thing, and so that's like an amazing thing. And I want to. I don't know if emulate is the exact word. I want to bring that idea in, where we're all kind of in it together. That it's not just a collaboration between students doing group projects, but it's literally a collaboration between everybody in the building, and really people outside the building. And I think that is like, when that is popping, it's just, it's amazing. And when it's clicking. And, and like, I am often um, in critiques, I'll do a lot of like small group crits or one-on-one -on -one crits, and I will, I just did, the, where's Elias? Like we just did this the other day in motion, I'm like, Elias, get your butt over here, tell me what you think of this. You know, and people come run over and give a 10 second crit and walk away. That's the game here. That's what it's about. That's why you're in a room with 20 other people, not on Zoom or on YouTube. That's what you're getting from this experience, and it is unmatched, I think, anywhere else. 
You can't do it on Scaleshare. You can't do it on Discord. It's in the room, elbow to elbow. I, I can't possibly explain how important that is. It's what it's all about. So. What's great about RIT? I mean, God, so many things. So many things. You know something that's really great that I think people kind of forget about? I actually just um, talked about this in an interview. Like, we have obviously a large deaf of heart and hard of hearing population here, as we are aware, right? I love, I am honored I get to teach deaf and hard of hearing students. It's a privilege to get to do that because it's a different voice. It's a different understanding. It's a different perspective. I love people who think I'm full of shit, respectfully, but, but they can think that because I want a different opinion. I want other people to talk, not just me. I, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful reality, and RIT has been incredible with that. You guys work your butts off, and you're in it. And, and that is, I mean, it's like, it brings tears to my eyes sometimes. It's just so awesome to see how into this you all are. It's a wonderful thing to get to do. And so I love that I get to teach people who disagree with me. It's the best thing in the world, right? I love that I get to teach people who have no comprehension of what my life is like, and I have no idea what their life is like, but we can come together in this kind of moment here. It's incredible. It's incredible. And really, it's, it's a privilege to get to do it. Yeah, well, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, Should we get some audience? I got one more. You got one more? Okay. We'll open it up. Um, you, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you coined this term or not, but you um, use a term that you call pulling yeah. in the book. And I, I think it's a really interesting frame. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about it. Yeah, so I basically talk about like pushing and pulling. And I think that it kind of goes to this. I don't know if you guys have even heard the term sage on a stage. It's something maybe some of our older faculty here may have heard back in the day. But it's an idea that there's like, you know, the person is literally on stage like talking at you. And you're like writing it down. And then you kind of put it back to us in an essay or on a multiple choice exam. And that's education. Um, that does not work here. That is not how this works. That is, excuse me, what I would call pushing, where I, as the teacher, am sort of saying, you need to know this, and I push it on you. Now, some of that is inherent in education, and some of it is actually completely necessary and needs to happen. But in addition to that, there has to be what I call pulling, which is where you all are asking of us what you need to know for a given project. You are not waiting for us to put it on you. You are pulling it from us. And that is something that is so crazy, crazy important in, in this kind of world we're living in. That is how you really learn, I think. It's kind of a combination of both. It isn't just, oh, Mitch said do that, I better use that typeface. It's not about that. It's, Mitch, why is this working? Why isn't this working? What about this? How about, have you seen this? What if I try, you know, that's the game here. That's what we're trying to get you all to do, is to pull your education. Um, what we are not trying to do is you all just kind of sit back and we just like wash knowledge over you. That is not what this is about. That is not how it works. Or at least not how it works well. I mean, I guess it does work sometimes. So for me, it's all about that kind of back and forth, that dialogue. Not us saying know this. It's you saying to us, do I need to know this? What should I know? What about blah, blah, blah? What about this? And that's when it gets fun and interesting and amazing. That's great. Yeah. Well, I think at this point um, we've shown enough of Mitch's philosophy and approach that there might be some questions uh, out there yeah. waiting for us. We and anything talking, goes, y'all. Anything goes. I, I do love to open this up yeah. to the audience. There's one. Skyway. Something I think we talk a lot about is the difference between like a deadline and the end of a project. Because it sort of feels like a project is never over, just like the deadline approaches. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you talked about that at all in this book. I'm trying to, I, yeah, I think it's like, it, it's, I think what you're talking about is kind of how, like, we have a, you know, we just had, we have midterm presentations in Capstone this week, right? You're not done. It's not done. It's just a point where we kind of pause and sort of reflect, right? And I would argue even when your Capstone is done in April, you're not done. You're just stopping that particular kind of thing. But ideally, it will spin off into other stuff. And so I think that a lot of what we do here in CAD, you know, in art and design, is sort of ask questions and then attempt to answer them pretty much until you die in a way that's really awesome, not, not in a negative way. And so that idea where you can sort of initiate thoughts that you can't quite answer in the time that we give you or the semester gives you, but that doesn't mean you can't keep going when you're done, right? And I think that idea, again, it's like this act of curiosity. Like, I don't need to make you care about this. You already care. I'm just going to help push you a little bit kind of here and there and get you going. 
And so I don't know if I should talk about that specifically in the book, but that's absolutely critically important. Mm -hmm. This idea that you sort of you pause, you sort of regroup, you kind of evaluate, usually with us in the room, and then you kind of keep going. And I think that's super, super important for sure. Well, one thing that I found in the book was that you, you did a great job of de-emphasizing um, the value that we tend to place on the finality yeah. of projects. So that might be a useful kind of perspective Absolutely. to read in the book. Yeah, I mean, my syllabi now, I think that I say that the final outcome, the actual thing you hand in is only 20% of your grade, which seems insanely low. But process is 50% of your grade, which to some people seems insanely high. But I think it's indicative of what I'm trying to talk about. That, that the thing you actually end with is obviously important. It's the thing you sort of get paid for theoretically by the client. Personally, I think what you get paid for is the process. I think that what someone is paying you to make work, they're paying you for that process that you go through to get to the thing. Because theoretically, anybody can generate the thing. You know, you have a kind of a unique vision on it. But what they can't do is how you do it. Only you can do it how you do it. And that is where your value is as an employee. And I think it's kind of the same idea, that it's really about this journey, and the destination is there, and it's important, and you want to end. But that's not kind of what you're doing, especially here. Commercial practice is a little bit different, but here it is about really this educational opportunity to learn. And that is why I'm so big on process, and why I want you all to really be cranking process. And the outcome it matters, but it isn't the only thing that matters. Some people disagree with me on that very strongly, and think that is literally the only thing that matters, is the thing you end. We have a difference of opinion on that. So. I'm with you. Yeah. Not Josh and I. I mean, me and people who aren't in the room right now. Um, just, to, just to kind of um, dovetail into this um, question that came up, um, you, you do offer a lot of <laughs> sage advice, excuse the comparison. Fair enough. Um, I think one of my favorites is don't be a jerk. Yeah. Okay. I, which sounds yeah, just, right, but please yeah, just don't, don't. There's no reason to be an asshole. Just straight up. Just, just straight up. We all have personalities. We're all different and everything, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. But we are here together in this kind of convivial space to learn and make better stuff with each other's help. So just be a good, just be kind to each other. And I think really here it's not as much of a problem. I've been at other certain elite institutions that Josh and I both attended where there is this really vile disgusting like underbelly of competition that's really gross and my senior year at um this school that i shall not name that's in rhode island that is a design school um <laughs> there was a really brutal sort of senior year where everybody was kind of negging each other and kind of being really like digging at each other and oh uh, oh you only had two interviews i had 10 interviews you know and it's just this toxic garbage just there's no need for it it doesn't do anything but make everything more wigged out Right? And the first day at Capstone, I think I said this to you all, like you got to be in it together. You are all your first professional network. You may not realize that, but you are. And so just be good people. Just straight up be good human beings. And everything else will not necessarily fall into place, but it will be easier. And you can kind of eliminate this, just this toxic garbage that's totally, I don't know why I use the word toxic all the time, but it's just the word that fits, right? Just this nastiness that's just really unnecessary and Again, I don't know, maybe it was my class, we were jerks or something, but it was just a really unpleasant. Like, my senior year, I don't remember fondly at all. I was like, ugh, that could have been sort of more fun and more interesting, you know? I'm really not friendly with anybody. I'm friendly with, like, one or two people from that class, and that's it. And that's too bad, you know? So I think that's kind of super important to just not be mean, yeah. not be horrible. Um, you, you make it clear. I think I make it clear in the book, yeah. Um, what other questions do you guys have? Yeah, John. Uh, you might have, you sort of you might have answered this already, talking about process, emphasizing process over the final product. But um, and I agree with everything you've said about RIT specifically, but the academic environment. But we are sort of an accredited institution with ancient processes and must evaluate, right, to give someone a degree. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious. I know you mentioned this a little bit without giving too much away about grading and how you evaluate which is the transaction that ultimately people seem to come here for, right? Yeah. Ooh, that's a big question. John Apps, ladies and gentlemen. John Apps. <laughs> yeah, um, that is, I am, I think, the th I am not good at many, 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 many things. Among them is grading. Um, I am real bad at grading, and I think you all have had me know that. Uh, it's just something that I fundamentally disagree with. 
I think it's a holdover. It, it's trying to, I want to make sure I say this right, quantify a qualitative idea. Is that the right words? Yeah. You're trying to put like a letter on this abstract notion of goodness that you've done over time. And so if you worked, whatever, 100 hours on a project, maybe you did stuff that didn't work, maybe you went down roads that didn't go anywhere, you, you, you know, you, the sort of final thing you actually hand in is maybe not that awesome, but your process was really good, and you really explored, and you really dove in, and you took some risks. I see that as like an A. I mean, I see that as like an A+. Plus. If you had kind of a very predictable process, you kind of did what you were comfortable with, you know how to do it, you just did that, and you end with something that is very competent, I, to me that's kind of like a C. It's like, okay, fine. You know, I don't think that's what you're here for. This is an amazing place to make the worst work you have ever made in your entire life. It is the best possible place to suck at what you're doing. Because you're in this environment where we're all here to help you suck less. And maybe even be amazing, right? So I want the students to do that. So that's why I say, like, I grade on risk as much as I grade on the thing being perfectly kerned or whatever it is. Um, and again, I'm not good at it. I'm saying this very like. I got it together. I do not have it together. I, I'm, every semester, I'm like, I have no idea how to do this. I keep screwing it up every time. Trying to get better and better at it. But I just think it's such an antiquated idea, except for two people. Your parents, who care a lot about your letter grade. And sort of financial aid stuff can kind of matter your GPA. And that's just an unfortunate holdover from whatever, the 50s, 60s, you know, bauhaus -y kind of stuff. And it's just too bad. Um, my personal opinion is college should be, or design school should be pass fail. Period. But again, I don't, I don't make policy, although Todd is here, so that's good. Yeah. Um, so that's my opinion, because I just think it isn't about that. Right. Like, I gave you a B. What does that mean? Well, it means you didn't get a C, but you didn't get an A. Like, it doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? It's just arbitrary. In my classes, you're evaluated every single time I talk to you. And every time you talk to your classmates, because you're doing work and we're talking about your stuff. Like, you don't need the letter grade. Like, if you kind of, like, get a grade at the end of the semester and you had no clue it was going to be that, that's a problem. Not that you got a bad grade, but that you didn't know where you were at. Not because you checked my courses for your grades, but because you're talking to your teachers and your, your colleagues in class all the time about it. Like, grades should never be a surprise to anybody. But, again, I'm not good at that. Like, I'm not the guy to talk to about how that works. But that's just my, like, that's my, like, working theory that I keep trying to figure out kind of over time. There was a question over here, I think. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so earlier you mentioned like the topic of self care, and uh, I I think you're not uh, like w we have been hearing this like uh, from a lot of mm -hmm. places where like oh you gotta take care of yourself you don't you have to, uh, don't have to grind for projects right. and all that kind of stuff and we've been trying to do that, but like sometimes it's just like the deadlines there, yep. and then sometimes you just like work on a project and then like your progress does not seem great and you want to work on it more and you need more time. So how do you like actually achieve the okay. self-care part? Good question and a very legit question. Mm -hmm. I say this not to be snarky. Sometimes you just gotta stop and just take a day off. And I know that sounds like, what are you talking about, dude? I have a final in three days that's due. It sounds like the most stupid advice in the world, right? Mm -hmm. I will tell you from experience, having taught a lot of students over whatever, 18 years now, whatever it's long, I have never seen a student who is absolutely killing themselves make amazing stuff. They get it done, and it's not necessarily bad. It might be even good. But it's never like, wow, that thing you did at 5 a.m. on Tuesday after like 20 coffees, was that has never happened. And so it sounds really opposite of what makes sense, but I would suggest you take an afternoon off. Just take a breather. And you're thinking, dude, that's the stupidest thing you've ever heard somebody say, right? But like, it really will actually give you the benefit down the road. Because that moment of reset, a few hours of sleep, take a breather, take a walk, go out to dinner with a friend, it actually feeds you so much more than spending 30 extra hours in studio, you know, until 2 a.m. every day. Mm -hmm. Again, I, there's, I can't prove that to you, but I, I really do believe that's true, and I have seen that happen. Um, and I think, honestly, and again, I don't want to speak for our illustrious faculty here, but my belief is that we're getting better at paying attention to that. I think teachers are realizing, oh, so maybe like really like killing the students is not good. It's not helping, <laughs> you know? Maybe like burying them every week is not good. Um, and so that's, again, it's, it's a philosophy lesson. I can't prove it to you, but I believe that's really true. 
But I agree with you. There are going to be days where you're going to just have to work your butt off. It's going to happen. I've done it. Um, when I was in architecture school back in the day, it was just understood you were doing two or three all-nighters a week. Period. It wasn't even a debate. And I'm not being facetious. It was absolutely made clear that if you're not doing two to three all-nighters every week, so I would sleep two to three nights a week, you're just not doing it well enough, and you better get moving. And that is just insane. And, you know, you have an architecture sort of background. I don't know if that was true at Cornell, but it is like, it's like, what is wrong with us? Why are we making you all do that? You know? And so I think it's a really difficult question to answer. I know kind of what you're saying, like practically how do you do it? I think you have to sort of not take a stand against your teachers, but just sort of say, I'm taking a day off. And, and, you know, I give my students, again, we all have different policies, but I give my students two free absences a semester. I think most of us do that. I don't need an excuse. You don't need to tell me you lost your car. I don't just say, I don't feel like coming in today. No problem. You're still responsible for what you missed. You still got to get it done. You know, all that stuff is still on you. But I have absolutely no problem with the students just saying, I'm taking a day off today. No problem. Please do. I don't need some bullshit reason why you're not here. And I think that more and more of us are getting that. I think we're understanding how challenging this environment is. And I think what's really happening now that's really wonderful is like the like the, the like empathy loop. We're kind of coming back to being like, oh yeah, this is really hard. <laughs> like what we're making y'all do. And so I think it's getting better. And, and I think if you say to a teacher, I just need a day off. Not, I've taken nine days off, I need a tenth. But like, I've been cranking all semester, I really am just taking a day. Nobody's gonna be like, how dare you? They're gonna be like, okay, no problem. You know, it's really just not a problem. So I think you just have to be kind of honest with yourself about what you really need at a given time. Maybe what you need is time off. Maybe you need to see a, a, a partner or a friend or whatever. Maybe you need to go out of town for a day. It's just do it. I would say do it. But again, I'm not teaching every class you're in, so. Don't say Mitch said it was cool if I didn't come in. Yeah, that's not okay. But that's what I think. Okay. Other questions? There's one over there. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, how teaching is one of the greatest things a person, especially a designer, can do. And I've heard a lot of people uh, teachers, educators, um, talk about how passionate they are about teaching. Why do you think that um, visual artists and designers, especially maybe more than most, uh, feel it's very appealing to them to teach younger people, especially? It, it's infinitely stimulating, endlessly stimulating. What you all don't realize is I get more from you than I give you. And that's not intentional, I'm not holding back. It's just the nature of the beast. Because I get to see, whatever, 20 to 60 people a day doing cool stuff. And I get to be in the room with you doing it. And I think we find that appealing. Because it's constantly stimulating. Like, I walk out of a day of teaching, like, tired, but I, like, almost want to make more stuff. Like, I get, it gets popping. My brain starts going, oh, oh, you know. And it's not that I'm copying or anything like that. It's just the, the, the stimulation of creativity is so amazing to get to see. And... Personally, this is not for everybody, I personally consider teaching, writing a book, doing stuff on Twitter, making furniture, it's all to me one thing. It's not 27 separate things, it's my creative practice, it's all one thing. So to me, getting to teach a bunch of students and getting to sort of explain things and talk to them and having them explain things and talk to me, and then I get to go write something like a book, and then I get to go make my own work, it's like such an infinitely interesting thing to get to do that it's like a dream. Like, I don't like summers. I want to be here teaching. I like a week here and there, but like, I don't like summer break at all. I'm bad at summer break. I'd rather be teaching. Because to me, it's just so, I, I feel like it's so cheesy. It's just so wonderful to get to do it. You know, I didn't, I, I assure you that I'm not writing this to make money. <laughs> like, that is not gonna happen. But I got to write a book. Like, I got to. And it's incredible, it's a privilege, you know? And so that's what I think. And I think most teachers would probably say the same thing. That you all don't realize it, but we're like, ooh, like we're like buzzing when we get out of a classroom. It's like, yeah, you know? So that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. More questions yeah. from you guys? Yeah. There's one back there. What do you think about engineering teaching? And how would you apply what you say in your book to that? Is there any alleviation? Is there any hope? or the staging stage practices that appear there? Yeah, I, it, honestly, I'm not, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. I have no idea. Um, I haven't done engineering, but I would say that engineering is certainly a creative field, right? In a, maybe in a slightly different way, in more of a, maybe a STEM kind of way, but it's definitely creati creativity. 
right? It's definitely trying to find answers to things, trying to figure out how to do stuff and all that. I would say like 98% of this probably applies, I think. But again, I haven't taught engineering, so I'm not necessarily the right person to answer that question. Um, but I would imagine that as students in general, ultimately you're learning how to, how to make engineers, whatever, doctor, you know, you're all making stuff. Maybe you're making people healthy, maybe you're making art, maybe you're making a bridge, maybe you're making a piece of software, you're still making. And I think as people who make stuff, as people who invent something that didn't exist before you invented it, I think what I'm saying is probably pretty applicable, I think. I mean, invite me to teach a class. I don't know, can I teach an engineering? I guess sure. we'll find out, yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, I, I mean, I, I would honestly, I, in all seriousness, I would be interested to hear, have some sort of STEM people read this. I'd be curious what STEM educators think of the book, actually. I don't know if they would think it's total garbage or if they're like, oh yeah. Like, I don't know how to answer, that's a really good question. I would be curious to know the answer to that I would myself. like to see the results of that as well. Yeah, I'd be curious. Well, there, there are a lot of universals in the book that I think, yeah, I think so. applicable no matter the discipline. Um, to, to that end, um, you, you talk a lot about uh, advocating for or helping to empower what you call Eunice. Yeah. Like you. Yeah, you, Y-O-U dash Ness. Um, yeah. That, that's the great trick, right? How Absolutely. do you empower young people to assume an identity and to thrive within that mm -hmm. practice? I wonder if you could speak to some of the tips that you yeah, suggest. Yeah, I, I think that I, I sort of use the word agency a lot. Um, I think that what's something really important for you all as students to have is agency in your work. Not to say, well, Mitch said to do this, so I should do that, so I'll get an A. That's not having agency. That's not about you. That's about me, right? And I don't want you to be me. I'm enough me. We're covered with Mitch. We're good. We don't need more. So I want you to be who you are, and I want you to figure out how you are kind of getting to where you're going. And part of that is having ownership over what you're doing. It's sort of all the stuff in the book. It's pulling. It's self-care. It's all the same stuff. It's kind of all in this kind of mix together. And so when you, as students, sort of own your education and you take it from us, in a sense, you pull it from us, then it's about you, not about me. It's about what you want to do. It's how you would do the project. It's the choices you would make, not the choices you think I want you to make. That is not relevant. Maybe there's some importance there, but it's really not about that. It's about the you-ness in your work. It's about what you think you should do. And that's why in critiques, we can do brainstorms where we bounce ideas off each other. That's not a critique. That's a brainstorm. But I don't like critiques where somebody's like, that isn't working. Maybe if you made it purple or what. That is not critique. That's saying do that. And that's a different ball of wax. It's not necessarily useless, but it's a different ball game. Whereas somebody just saying, this doesn't work, I don't get it, to me it says this, but you thought it would say this, that's really useful feedback because then you can say, oh, okay, this isn't doing what I thought it would do, what could I do to make it do what I want it to do? That was a lot of the word do, but you get what I'm saying. Um, and so I think that's really critical important. And that takes time to really learn how to do, because a lot of you are coming out of high school, especially as freshmen, obviously, where it's like, that isn't kind of how it works in high school, in my experience, right? It's much more of a sort of do it this way kind of thing. Um, not always, but mostly. But here, like, the gates are open now. And kind of anything sort of goes here. And, and I think that's, again, in my opinion, you've got to do that. You've got to grab that. That's what it's about. You know, really taking charge of what you're doing. So. Great. Yeah. There's a question here. Christine? Ah, Christine Shank. Yeah. Um, so it's obvious that you really love teaching. Yeah. And... Um, I know that, you know, I know that you grew up in the United States, so I know you went to school for a very long time. You've been teaching for like 18 years. Mm -hmm. You have had at least two master's degrees. Is there any point in your educational journey that really um, impacted you in a way that caused you to become the kind of educator you are now? Boy, that's a good question. Um, Probably many. Um, I think that my um, initial undergrad experience when I was 18 out of college, out of high school in the 90s was at Syracuse University Architecture, which was not a good experience for me. Um, for many, many, many reasons. Amongst them was I was not nearly as smart as I thought I was. That was a big one. That did not contribute to me doing well. Um, 
And so I think that going through that experience, which it, it's a very good program, it's an excellent school, it was just like, I don't, that didn't work for me. Like that was not working the way they taught. It was kind of all the stuff I'm sort of talking about against, all the stuff I've been talking about tonight. Um, and so that was kind of one thing that happened when I was much younger. And then when I got to college, um, I had a couple of kind of key moments with some faculty. And I think all of you have this, maybe not every day, maybe once a semester, but you'll get these moments where all of a sudden something kind of crystallizes. And you'll be like, oh, I can do that. I didn't even know that was a thing. And so I had some moments like that, that were, again, mostly about, those of you who know my work, it's like processy and it's sort of those kind of things where something would click and I'd be like, oh shit, I'm, I'm allowed to do that, whatever it is, and yeah, you can do whatever you want. So there were some moments like that. I had a few faculty when I was on my first year at RISD. Um, I was in graphic design, and this is very graphic design specific, but as a graphic designer, I work with typography. And I had a, a teacher who did a project, um, this guy Franz Werner, who teaches, I think he's retired now. Um, and he, the class was basically called photo slash graphics, like P-H-O-T-O slash graphics. And it was about sort of using the camera to make graphic design. And I wasn't aware that was possible when I was kind of coming in. I, w I was like, what, what, what do you mean we're using the camera? You mean take pictures of stuff to put next to the text, right? No, we actually took photos of typography. We like made little models of type and took weird photos of them and then put them into layouts and stuff. And it like melted my face off. I was like, how is, you can do that? So there's moments like that that happen. And, and I don't know if any of you, my students have had those moments with me, but I hope so. I mean, that would be the ultimate compliment, right? So I had a few kind of things like that where something just, um, like twisted your worldview in a way, in a good way. It, it altered how you perceive what making is. Um, and I got, was lucky enough to have a few of those moments. I mean, I'm talking like maybe four or five over the course of my career, but I gotta tell you, it totally changed who I am, completely altered it. And I think selfishly part of teaching is making those moments happen or, or hoping those moments happen, trying to make those moments happen for students. Because when you can get a student, sometimes you see a student and their eyes just go, oh, and they get it. It's like so satisfying. I mean, that's kind of selfish, but it's really like, mm, you know, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and so those moments, which again, I, you guys would have to ask my students whether I, th I think we get them sometimes. I mean, I hope that happens. I don't know. I think it happens sometimes. But that is like really like, oh, okay. And it, it alters who you are. And those moments are, are priceless. They're the most valuable thing on the planet as, a, as someone who makes stuff. Yeah, and so getting to have that happen to me was like, I want to do that. Like, you I mean, I could get paid to do that, like as a job? Like, it's incredible. No arguments here. On that. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions from you yeah, all? We're time. Oh, we're almost. We're, we're almost about an hour. Yeah. If there are any more questions, we'll certainly take them. Yep. Yeah. Um, some of us are graduating this um, semester, and we're going to you know, search for jobs. Do you see any of the principles that you talked about um, apply to kind of that job search process or application? Oh, process? absolutely, yeah. Who's graduating this year? Who's, whoop, sorry. I think I actually turned this off. Hang on. Um, who's nervous about it? Yeah, right, you're all freaking out, right? <laughs> um, I gotta tell you, hunting for a job now sucks. Like, I'm sorry, it just, it sucks, period. Um, but I think there's some sort of strategies you can use. Um, a big one, I think, is being really who you are. Um, I talk a lot about, especially my seniors right now, about like what's in your portfolio. And I think what people tend to put in their portfolio is what they think the job wants. But that is not what the job wants, because anybody can make that stuff. They want you. They hire you, not your portfolio. They hire the person, not the work you did. Anybody can use Photoshop. That's no longer like a, ooh, you know Photoshop. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just inherent. Like, you're born with Photoshop, right? Like, as soon as you're born, you start paying Adobe $70 a month, right? That's what it feels like. Um, so I think that being very true to yourself is really important. And the reason why it's important is that you don't want a job that you don't fit with. Like, that would suck. Now, being homeless would suck more, so you should take the job, right? But I think you can take the job and then find maybe the good job after you get the first one, right? So I think that's actually super important. Being kind of true to who you are, what you want, what kind of work you want to do. If you don't want to do UX, UI, don't put UX, UI stuff in your portfolio. If you don't want to do print work, don't put print work in your portfolio. Um, 
And I can tell you from experience, and I think Josh would agree, having looked at a lot of portfolios, done portfolio reviews, it is very obvious what students don't care about in their portfolios. It's very, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to put that in, right? Somebody told you to do that. So I think that's number one is really important. I think number two is part of just being organized, right? I hate to tell you guys, you might send out 100 resumes, maybe more. I mean, that's just reality, right? You gotta keep track, you gotta pay attention, you gotta make sure stuff is spelled right. You gotta make sure you don't send job A, the cover letter that was supposed to go to job B, which has happened to somebody on stage, talking to you right now, where I sent the wrong cover letter to a job. That's embarrassing, to say the least. So like all those little dumb BS, just sort of paying attention, detail stuff you gotta pay attention to. Um, and ultimately I think it's being, I don't really like the word passion, it sounds like kind of a cheesy word, but being kind of very clearly passionate about what you're doing and the work in your portfolio that matters. And that's why I personally think that if you are looking for, for example, like a UX UI job or a job developing software, but you also like painting or you like sculpture, that should be in your portfolio because that's part of who you are. It's part of your worldview. It's part of how you process the world. So somebody once said to me, why would you ever put like your fine art in your design portfolio? And I'm like, why wouldn't you? Like, of course you should. You're not just one thing, you're many things. We contain multitudes, as they say. And so I think that's crazy important. And I think, again, my personal experience has been, you can tell when somebody really gets that. When you see them put their work down, you're like, oh, okay, you're not kidding. Like, you're in it. Um, and so I think that, and just generally, just kind of the self-care stuff, because it, it's a process. Like, I, I hate to say it. I want to tell you guys, you're going to get, it'll take you two minutes, no problem. It's not. It's going to take a while. Um, some of you might already have gig jobs going, you know, but it's a process. It's a challenging process. In some ways, it's a very degrading and demeaning process. Um, you guys, nowadays, I'm hearing horror stories about doing six, seven, eight rounds of interviews, mm -hmm. which is, I can't even tell you how insane that is. That makes no sense. I just posted something about how, like, design tests, you guys know about design tests? That is the most biggest pile of crap I've ever heard of. That's insane. Um, it's easy for me to sit here and say you should say no because you want to get a job, you know, you're going to say yes, but like not okay in my book. That, that, that whole thing they're doing is just not good. So really I think you just got to be kind of who you are, not who you think they want you to be. That's really kind of in what I just babbled, but that's one sentence that really says it. Don't make this like imaginary version of you, because you really don't know what they want. What they really want is somebody they can sit next to 40, 50, 60 hours a week and make cool stuff with. That's what they want. Everybody can use Photoshop, it doesn't matter. But are you somebody that's interesting? Like, do you care? Are you in it? That's what they, they look for, I think. Well, that's probably an excellent way to wrap up yeah. with your uh, discussion. Yeah, and Eunice. scene, yeah. Um, well, I, I wanna thank you for a thank you. fantastic conversation and, and for a great book, which I hope does well in the world and, and reaches the audience that you <laughs> intended. I hope so. Um, I hope some of you all get a chance to read this, and uh, I, I, I'll speak for myself selfishly. I think it's wonderful to have you here at RIT with us. Thank you. Thank you for being a colleague. And it's a an friend. honor to be here. And uh, congrats on the book. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Appreciate all the support, again, from both the administration who's here, the other faculty, you guys. It's been amazing. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.